Turn your Bibles with me to Proverbs 3. We're going to finish up our uh, talk, our discussion over the last four or five weeks. We've been talking about living on the promises, living on the promises. And we're going to finish up Proverbs 3, the last few uh, chapters, the last few verses in that. And King Solomon finishes up with four more promises, the last promises. But here's the thing. These promises are your choice. Some of them have good consequences, some of them have bad. Well, all the promises are good, but it's all your choice. It's all how we choose to accept and walk with God. That's what really matters. So in these last four verses, King Solomon, being led by the Holy Spirit, begins to share the gains of wisdom that come and the promises that come with wisdom when we follow the Lord. And uh, if you know anything about King Solomon, you know that he didn't always choose what was right. In his life, we give him a lot of accolades uh, for being the wisest man ever, but he did make some mistakes along the way. And so it's through this and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we get Proverbs 3, and especially these last few verses. So if you'll turn and read with me, Proverbs 3, 31 through 35, 31 through 35. And it reads this way. Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. For the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are in his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. This why the wise will inherit honor, but fools get disgrace. Let us pray. Father, I pray that you would bless this word today. Lord, let us gain knowledge as how you would have us to live, but God, how we are blessed by it. So Father, if there's one in here today that doesn't know you, I pray that they'll come to know the ultimate wisdom is in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And God, in knowing Jesus, we understand how we can live and treat others and God, how we can be a symbol to a lost and dying and dark world. So, Lord, I pray for every heart that's struggling. And, Lord, for those that are in here rejoicing, I rejoice with them. Wherever we may find ourselves today, Lord, let us all be at peace with you. Let this word permeate into our hearts. And, Lord, let us go share it with all. In Jesus' name, all God's children say, amen. So, we got a funny culture we're living in today. We live in a culture that literally idolizes those that seem to do wrong. Matter of fact, if you turn on TV or go to most movies, it seems like the only way to be right is to do wrong. But before God, before he tells us anything about promises, there's this warning. It says, do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his wicked ways. Now, the Amplified Bible reads it this way. Do not resentfully envy or be jealous of an unscrupulous, grasping man and choose none of his ways. Even though we see people that are doing things they ought not to do, living ways they ought not to live, even though it seems like they're prospering, God says, don't don't do that. Don't be that type of person that wishes you had their gain. Don't do anything like they would do. Don't be like those people that are out there doing wrong. But we've always questioned that. God, why? Why does it seem like the evil prosper? Even Jeremiah, and Jeremiah 12, 1 says, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I complain to you. Jeremiah's getting ready to complain. You ever complain to God? Am I the only one that's ever complained? It ought not to be that way, God. Like, like God needs my input. You think God sits around on his throne all day waiting for us to give a little input? You ever think that? I don't think he does. I think he's okay with our praise, but I think he's got the rest took care of. But Jeremiah says, yet I would plead my case before you. Why does the way of the wicked person prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? Even in the day of Jeremiah, he had this question. Why God? But ultimately, God always answers the same way. They will not prosper in the end. They will not prevail. Don't worry about what the wicked and the evil are doing. Don't worry about them. Focus on me and you. That's the great thing about God. He's constantly reminding us, just focus on what we have. You ever focus on others? 
And then you ever get a pity party because it really looks like others are doing better? But yet we don't know their home life. We don't know what's going on. We think other people's marriages are better and other people's kids are better. Hey, I was in student ministry. I want you to know they all messed up by the time they turned teenagers. <laughs> but here's the thing. Don't worry about others. Focus. Uh, Solomon sitting there saying, look, focus on this. And then he begins us to give us promises. We had the promise of communion and counsel. As, it says, for the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are in his confidence. And uh, I need a little sip of water. Because I was in a hot kitchen cooking breakfast with my staff for you guys today. Actually, they did most of the cooking. I was the tater tot guy. I was supposed to put four or five tater tots in every one. And some of you are going like, well, preacher, I got a lot more than tater tots. Well, look, I just grabbed a handful and dumped it in there. So if you got more than four, you were just a blessing from the pasture. <laughs> God promises to those who follow his wisdom that they will have communion, meaning relationship with and counsel, meaning that God gives knowledge and direction. Now think about that for a moment. The creator of the universe, the one who is all, made all, and keeps everything going, just said, I promise you, if you seek my wisdom and keep me with you, you will have relationship and communion with me. You will have counsel. I will give you guidance and direction. What an amazing promise. Knowing that, I put it this way, knowing that we're never alone in our journey here on earth. Knowing that we will have knowledge and understanding and how to live and act. And knowing that we will never be lost or bewildered by what lies ahead. It's so simple. Just follow God's wisdom. Now, I didn't say it was easy. There's a lot of things that are simple. You know, if we want to build a, a road to China across the ocean. That's, that's pretty simple, but it ain't going to be easy. It reminds me of a joke one time, a uh, servant of God, uh, we'll call him Paul. God looked down at Paul and said, Paul, you've been so great. You've been so awesome. What can I do for you? He said, well, there's an island out there I heard of. It's called Hawaii, I, but I'm afraid to fly. I might share this with you a couple of years ago. He said, but I'm afraid to fly, God. Could you build a road from here to Hawaii so I could just drive there? And God looked down and said, now, Paul, you know that'd be too hard. You know that'd be too, that you, can, can you imagine the expenses? Can you imagine all the work that would entail? Surely there's something else, Paul, that you could use that would be a benefit to you. He said, well, I never have figured out women. Could you write me a book on how to understand women? God paused for a few minutes, looked back down. God paused and looked back down at Paul and said, you want that two lanes or four lanes? <laughs> Simple don't mean easy. When I tell you to follow and, and stay in God's wisdom, it, it doesn't mean it's easy. But it is possible. But how do we do that? We stay upright. Simply meaning we're, we stay upright to be righteous or choosing right. Choosing to stay right with the Lord. It comes with the understanding that we don't do anything that would hinder us with our relationship with God. We're unwavering in who we serve. Let's be honest. Most of the times we mess up in, the, in life is because we do our own thing. We, we go a different direction. We do what we're not supposed to do. We're, we, we think, well, I know this is the right thing to do, but and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But if we stay upright, if we choose to do what's right, God says, I will be with you in a relationship and I will guide you. Do you know how many people are outside the church and even inside the church? They don't, they don't follow God like they're supposed to. And then they wonder, why? Why? The word of God says they're devious. For the devious person is an abomination to the Lord. That word devious, now it sounds, you know, when you, you hear devious, well, you're just devious. Oh, well, that's the bad people. That's all the people in jail. 
That's the people that do heinous crimes. Ooh, when it, oh, God's really getting the devious people. But when you really look at what devious means, you're going to find out a lot of people in this room are classified as devious. What does it mean? In the way it's being used here, it simply means this. Those that turn away, go astray, or do not follow the Lord. Those that don't pay attention to what God is trying to teach them. Those that have decided that they know better. God says they're an abomination, meaning it literally disgusts him to the innermost part. You ever, you ever thought you knew more than God? You ever thought you had life figured out? And You know, see, see, God's in our schedule of life, but he's not in the direction of life. What do you mean schedule life? Well, we schedule God for precious, for worship, but he's not in our daily walk in the way that we live. There's a difference. You see, the devious is talking about here. I put it here, meaning we found something that we feel is wiser and more knowledgeable. The problem with that train of thought is there's nothing wiser or more knowledgeable than God. The devious person is literally the person that has placed wisdom above God's wisdom. And now that has become their idol. That is the devious person. That is the person that's gone away and that's the person that stepped outside of God's will. You see, you can't have communion. You can't be in relationship. Now listen to this because there's, there's people you're going to walk out and be like, I just don't understand why I'm not getting along with God. You can't have communion and God's guidance and tell God how you're going to do it. Well, God, I'll pay my bills my way. God, I'll raise my kids my way. Now, I'll be a Christian. I'll let you save me from hell. God, I'll let you do that. Because I realize I'm not the best person. But when it comes to my life, I've got it figured out. So kind of hold your space there, God. Don't, don't be bumping my grill. Okay? Stay where you're supposed to stay. When I need you, then I'll call. That's a devious person. Mm. <laughs> Sound like a lot of Christians, don't it? Huh? Huh? You know what? Hey, I ain't, I ain't gonna talk on tithing, but let me tell you something. You know what a devious person says? <laughs> God, I give you what I want you to have. Don't you ask for a dime more. <sighs> Statistics say I just hurt 60% of the church in this room. But that's a devious person. Thinking they got it figured out. But God says, the upright per the person that chooses to do right, I promise. Now, I spend a lot of time on that, folks. But there's a lot of issues that we wouldn't have to deal with in our life if we just chose to do what was right. But we also promise a blessed home. It says, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but, the, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Now, notice he says the dwelling. That means a home or a pleasant place. It's a place where we go and we rest and relax. I tell you, uh, I, I uh, went camping the other night. I really didn't go camping. They got rooms down there you can pay 30 bucks and sleep in. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> this year I stayed in there. I didn't sleep too well, but I slept a whole lot better than those when the thunderstorm came through at two in the morning. We got up and cooked breakfast. For, I couldn't sleep a wink. It was thundering and lightning, and I thought the trees were gonna fall down. Preacher, how'd you sleep? Good, I was in a cabin. Didn't think nothing of it till I woke up. I'll say this. There's a difference between a mattress and a mat. <laughs> they said, well, you got nice twin beds. They may have nice twin beds, but they got a mat this thick. Folks, I'm 200 mm -hmm, something pounds. <laughs> that mat was begging for mercy the first 70 pounds in. <laughs> but here's the thing, folks. Lily, you're laughing too hard. Oh, okay. <laughs> here's the thing. This comes with a picture of like a, a father talking to a son. So son, you need to recognize something. The reason that you're able to enjoy these blessings is because as a father, we follow God in this house. And God blesses this house. His, he, he has his hand on this house. Now here's the thing, when you leave this house and you become your own father and own leader, you can either have the same blessings that you were raised with, 
or you can deny God. But understand this, God's hand will not be on those that reject his blessing. Can't have it. You see, husbands, let me talk, husbands and fathers, we carry a burden. We're the spiritual leaders of our home. Whether we like it or not, dads, you're the spiritual leader of your home. The day you took this woman to be yours until God separates you, this is your responsibility. And I, I put it this way. If we truly love our families, then we will joyfully and faithfully follow the Lord. If we will live by his commandments, it will bring God's blessing upon our homes. Now, this doesn't imply that we're not going to have heartache and hurt and, and, and sorrow at times. But what it does mean is God's with us in those times. That God blesses us in those times. That God meets our needs in those times. God, God, listen, God wants to bless his people. We understand that. When people do nice things for you, you want to do nice things for them. But, but listen, God doesn't do it because he owes us. He does it because he loves us. And, and, and God wants to bless our home. But he curses those that seek and move against him. That word curse means to hate and to have judgment against. What, what, what is he talking about? He curses at home. What, here's what that simply means. If, if you're not in God's blessings, then you're cursed. He said, oh, well, that's a mean God. He curses. Here's how God curses. God says, you don't want nothing to do with me. You don't want to love me. You don't want me to bless your family. Here's how you're going to be cursed. I'm simply going to take my hand off your house. You wanted it your way. Do it your way. But know this. When the world, the devil, and all that comes at you, know that my hand, my shield of protection won't be there any longer. And it will look to the world like you've been cursed. Because nothing goes right for you. And the world will swear that you've been cursed because there's no favor, there's no blessing found in your home. But you know what's great about God? You say, well, loving God, that's how much God loves us. God loves us so much. He says, I love you so much. I will let you reject my blessings. You see, we live in this world and everyone says, I just want to throw it out there. Everybody's always like, you know, pastor, if God's so loving, why does he let all these bad things happen in the world? God doesn't let nothing bad happen in the world. We do. We let people, we, we're the ones that let it happen. God's given us everything we need to make this world a utopia if we wanted to, but there's no money in it for big business and there's no blessing in it for those that want to do nothing for others. So what happens? We take care of ourselves and the world suffers. You see, folks, God simply says, if you'll follow my wisdom, you'll find this great blessing. But if you try to do it your own way, then my hand's off of you. And you're going to find out that you're not going to be able to make it without me. We do that to our own children at times. We act like that's mean, but we do that to our children. Well, son, well, sweetie, you want to do it your way, you do it your way. Do it your way. See what happens. And it kills us as parents when we do that. But there comes a time when you got to tell your children, look, you don't want my blessing. You don't want my favor. It's like this way. You're not going to come all up in my house, eat my food, sleep in my bed, drive my car, and me pay your bills, and you tell me how it's going to be. It's my way, buddy. That's how I talk to my boys. Well, preacher, that's so mean. You know, it's just plain, loud talk. It ain't yelling. But don't we like that? We say, God, you give me the blessings. Give me everything I want. And I'll tell you how it's going to be. You wouldn't, take, you wouldn't put up with that a day. You think God is? The only difference between God and us is God's got enough grace and mercy to forgive us. Sometimes it, they come back all humble. I'm sorry, Williams. You need to suffer a little longer because I ain't happy with how much you've suffered yet. But God forgives 
But you can have blessing in your home, but we got to follow God's wisdom also. We see there's the promise of favor. Towards scorners, he is scornful, but to the humble, he gives favor. That word favor means to be gracious and kind. It means to, that we are precious in God's sight. God desires to be so gracious and kind to us that he wants us to call him Father. Now think about that. The King and the Creator, the Alpha and the Omega, says, call me Daddy. I, I want to have such favor on you that it's like a father taking care of his child and everyone says, you ever met the parent? You know, they just spoil that child too much. Spoil them. Look, buy them a new car. Can you believe they bought them a new car? I had to drive a, a clunker with no engine up the hill in the snow both ways when I was that age. <laughs> you know we all say that. Barefooted, <laughs> like the Flintstones, <laughs> buying that kid a new car and buying her all them pretty clothes and dresses. And, and can you believe they do that? And, and you know what that daddy over there does that's doing that? He don't care what you think because he wants to dote on his little boy and his little girl. Folks, that's God up in heaven. I don't care if the world thinks you deserve it or not. This is my blessings and I want to give favor to my kids and my kids are going to know that daddy loves them. You don't have to question your father's love. That's what that promise is. How do we have that? Well, we got to be humble. That word humble is funny. It means to be meek and gentle and needy. We get that wrong a lot of times, you know, folks. We get it wrong. We, we think that we got to walk around and look all impoverished and hungry and begging for the scraps of the world and, and, and hoping that God might take notice of us. That ain't what that means. We, we look at God like he's some 10 billion old person sitting in a retirement home eating pudding, waiting for someone to change his diaper. That's how we treat God sometimes. God's on the throne. That word humble there, it really deals how we treat our relationship with God. Let me give you some words. Meek. We're not to be violent and aggressive in the relationship. We're not demanding. You know, I don't think I've ever demanded something from God and he, he, <laughs> he acted like he had to do it. But I have begged and pleaded and asked. We're to be meek and to be gentle. We take care not to jeopardize the precious gift of our relationship with God. We'd never do anything to hurt what we have with the Father and needy. We know that we need our Father, Lord, in all that we do. When's the last time you went before God in prayer and you were so humbled by your need for him, it put your nose in the dust? Most of us in this room, our nose have not been planted in the dust in years. It's been so long since we've taken notice of how blessed we are and how great God is that, that we don't even know what God's doing for us. When's the last time you were in tears? Because you needed God so bad that you wanted God to know that he was your everything. Yeah, we'll lead songs like that in this church and other churches will do it and everybody just sit there. I ain't singing. I ain't gonna do it. I ain't singing about how great God is. Nope, nope, nope. I ain't gonna do it. I got my pride. This is where we come to sing and praise and shout to the one that meets the needs of the needy. Preacher, I ain't needed no one. Yeah, you are. Well, my dad used to say, don't get so big in your britches, you can't find your shoes. Folks, always be needy for the Lord. It tells us in James 4.10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Don't be scorners. That, that word scorners means to talk against, to make fun of and mock. You say, pastor, none of us in this room would mock or make fun of God, but we do. We do. Well, preacher, that's me. That's people who say, God, if you're alive, strike me down with lightning and prove to everyone. God ain't got to prove nothing to you. When I was winning all these world championships and all these Guinness Book of World Records and, and, and on ESPN, I mean, yeah, ESPN and all these sports things, I'd have these little bucks come up. He's so strong, go over there and bench press 800 pounds right now. I'm like... 
I don't have to prove nothing to you. If the testimony of everyone that's seen what I've done is enough for you, then me doing it ain't going to prove nothing either. Folks, if God's testimony by people that testified for over 4,000 years ain't enough, you think God's going to get off his throne and, 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 <laughs> and make this beer great? <laughs> but I'm okay with that. <laughs> here's the thing, folks. Here's how we mock God. You ever said any of these phrases? I know the Bible says it's wrong, but... I know I shouldn't do this, but... I know the Bible is out of touch with our culture. So therefore... That's speaking for God. Why, you're braver than I am. I'm scared enough just to get preached about his word, but I can't believe there's people out there who say, well, you know, God's kind of out of touch with the culture, so I'll speak for him. Woo, boy, you got some lead in your britches. I wouldn't do that. And I think if God really understood today's times, he would be okay with. You ever seen any of those? That's scorners. That's people that mock God and say that he's not relevant. Let me tell you something, folks. He's still sitting where he's always sat. Don't think he ain't big enough to step down and show what he's about. Here's the thing. He's already told us when he's going to do it. You know when he said he's going to do it? When man gets so... I'm just going to southernize it up a little bit. When man gets so stupid... He can't even recognize the fact that he can't make a grain of salt without something that I've made. I'm going to show up and show them who made everything. And folks, we're getting really close to that. We mock God so often we don't even realize it. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do this anyway. That's a mockery. The word of God says a fool. You know what a fool is? It's someone that knows to do better and, do, and does otherwise. It's like when you have, let's say you have a teenage son. And you say the truck's on its last leg. Don't take it mudding. Don't treat it like a four-wheel drive. It's about to die. Just baby it a couple more months until we can do better. And you come home. And it's covered in mud. And it doesn't run. And he says, I thought it'd make it. That's a imagery of what foolishness looks like. <laughs> and 30 minutes later, you got to text your minister of music and say, my foolish son won't be there tonight because he went mudding in a truck. <laughs> that was designed to never leave asphalt. I was so embarrassed to see you that hour. You know where that truck's sitting right now? In the same spot it was last week. <sighs> Here's the thing, folks. I know that's, I'm being cute, but the truth is, we do silly things. And God's not gonna have favor on us when we do silly things. Things we know we ought not to do. But God goes on to say, I will give you the promise of my glory. Look what he says. To the wise will inherit honor, but fools get disgrace. King Solomon closes our text with the promise of receiving God's glory. That's what that word honor means. It means to receive God's glory. It, it means that God looks at us and says, I want to honor you, but not with something that, that's not so precious that it's not special to me. God says, I want to honor you with my glory, my glory. That's, that's the benefit of being God's child. God says, you're my child. Matter of fact, when we go into heaven, 
we, we, we walk in and, and they're like, man, that's a child of God. The angels are like, what's it like to be a child of God? We're, we were created, but we're not his children. You're his children. What's it like to be a child of God? Man, what's it like to, to have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords step up off the throne of heaven and say, that's my little boy. That's my little girl. What is that like? And the angels are literally confused. Because God's glory is being given to a redeemed sinner. You get that the day you step in the glory. But it says those to their own disgrace. That word disgrace means shame and dishonor and reproach. You know what, that, you know what he's saying? People get up to heaven. Well, I just thought if I was good enough. Well, I didn't believe in all that stuff about the Bible, but I did follow other faiths and religions. And overall, I was a pretty good person. And here's what that means. It doesn't mean God's going to disgrace them. It means their disgrace is because they didn't believe the one truth above all truths. And that is Jesus is the Son of God. No man cometh to the Father except by me. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't have these blessings. You can't live on these promises unless you're a child of God. So let me ask you a question. Does that come to a close? Are you, when, when I read these texts, are you one living on the promises or are you the other side? Are you following God's wisdom or do you say, well... I know the Bible says that, but I believe this. Well, I'm a Christian, but I do that, Pastor. Really? Is there something in the Bible that you've got that I've never read? Because I didn't know I could defy God's word and receive God's blessings from his word. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. Me and, me and God, we got a little something cooked up, worked out. It's a little different than everybody else's, but I'm special. No, you're not. You're not. Let me burst your little spiritual bubble. You're not special. Unless you're a child of God. And children of God. Well, they don't get any breaks when it comes to the fact that God says, I want to bless you, but you must be mine. And if you really, Jesus even said this, if you love me, you'll follow my commandments. Now, that doesn't mean we work our way to heaven. It simply means that if we love God, will live in a way that shows we love him. You can't defy him and receive his blessing and his honor. You see, there's going to be a lot of people in churches that went to church their whole life. And when they step into heaven or they step to the pearly gates, to their own disgrace, they'll be, they'll be sent away. And there's only one other place to go. And here's what they're going to say. I thought my way, I thought my way was a better way. Here's what they're really going to say. Wow. It was real. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. You've got to live on the promises. And you only get to do that by following his wisdom. And that is his son, Jesus Christ.